according to the South African Hearing Institute, our hearing ability naturally declines from age 30 or 40. In fact, by age 80, more than half of us humans will suffer from significant hearing loss. Now, while hearing loss is a natural part of ageing, it could also occur as a result of disease or infection. We are joined now by Professor Mashudu, who has been at the forefront of transformation in South Africa's medical profession. He was the first black ENT specialist and among the youngest in the country. And now, together with his team, they have performed the world's first middle ear surgery using 3D technology. If you've got any questions for Prof Mashudu, please connect with us online. And don't forget to use the hashtag Afternoon Express in your comments. Wow, what an achievement. Congratulations on all of your success. No, thank you so much. Thank you Welcome so much. to the show. It is an absolute honour to have you here. No, it is an honour for me also. Let's go back to your life as a young doctor. What is it about becoming an ENT that inspired you? Why did you decide to specialise in that? Because when I grew up, I always was fascinated by a sense of hearing. Yeah. And I suffered a lot from running nose. So I used yeah. to have a lot of running nose and I also used to suffer from tonsils. Wow. So those three things uh, made me uh, become very interested in becoming an ENT yeah. specialist. And I think that's an interesting thing about studying. I think you always do yes. better at the subjects that you are genuinely more concerned about exactly. or that you're genuinely exactly. interested yes, in. Yes, yes, yes. Now, congratulations about this absolutely huge achievement. Thank it you makes so you much. one of the best doctors in the world. Um, you know, you, you, you're sitting alongside Professor Chris Barnard with yes. the heart surgery. But what exactly, the, you did the first middle ear operation. What what exactly does that mean? It means that um, I re-change or refocus yeah. the middle ear operation using a 3D technology. What does that mean? It means that um, I've advanced medicine because the last time we did a breakthrough innovation in this field yeah. was in 1956 wow. and it was in America. Yeah. So from 1956 and now, and of course having our Chris Barnard, but in the middle ear, which is the smallest bone, mm. this is what I've done with this one, with the 3D technology. Incredible. Yes. So what, who, I mean, who would need an operation like this? It's any person with a problem of conductive hearing loss, because yeah. as you are listening to me and people are listening on TV, there's outer ear, middle ear, and inner ear, and then it goes to the brain. Yeah. So the middle ear is like your amplifier, it's like your speaker. It's like you're watching TV without a sound. Yeah. So anybody who has a problem of the middle ear, this is what this technology is all about. Okay. So we reconstruct that amplified system, which so was not... So the person that you operated on yes. basically got a middle ear infection and then lost their hearing. Yes. And then you did the operation and they regained their hearing. Exactly, yes. Wow, yes. they must love you. Imagine yes, regaining yes, yes, something yes. that is such a tremendous loss. Yes, yes, yes. So when you say you made use of 3D technology, what does that mean? What we did is that uh, we take a CT scan and we visualize your bones and we see which one is damaged. Yeah. And then we take that picture of your um, middle ear bones yeah. and we take it into the computer. Yeah, so and we instruct are... the computer to recreate the whole thing. That is unbelievable. Yeah. How common is something like this? Like how many people would need to have an operation as such? Um, the statistics uh, according to WHO is that million, almost billion of people all over the world, they will need some form of hearing loss, wow. of, of, of conductive hearing loss that need to be treated. Yeah. So even in our country, we know that as you're giving the South African statistic, millions of people will need that uh, that uh, uh, technology to help them, yes. You're a hero, you know that. I did not know, I'm humbled. You no, know, I'm just doing what I enjoy, you oh, know. That is great. Yeah, so now you yeah. were able to give someone who, so the person who operated on, they were born with hearing, lost it over time and then now regained it. But yes. would you be able to do a similar operation to someone who's never been able to hear? Would the same operation work? As long as there's a middle ear bone that are damaged, we can do it to any age really? and any patient. That's that what we're looking forward to, yes. What is it that causes the damage to that middle ear? And I mean, is it preventable or does it just wear out over time? And like, does, is everyone susceptible to losing that hearing? All of us were susceptible. So some of them you might be born without. Yeah. Some you can have trauma. 
or you might have an accident, or sometimes there's a condition called autosclerosis, mm -hmm. where your small bone, they just stop moving. Yeah. So anything that damage them, you know, f uh, infection from flu, from bacteria, it can damage those bones. How many years did you have to study in order to, or, or work, I suppose, on this incredible achievement? Because this is your life's work. I've been studying deafness for the past 25 years. Yeah. But for the past 10 years, I've been concentrating on how can I improve this middle ear. Yeah. The last three years, I've been using a 3D technology. Yeah. And March this year, yeah, I am. Incredible. Yes. How long was the surgery and did you have any complications? The surgery can take uh, three uh, to four hours. Yeah. Uh, with this patient because he also had previous operations which were not successful. So it was a little bit tricky, but because I've done a lot of practice before the day, fortunately everything went well. Now, how does an operation like this work? Is it keyhole? Do you go into the ear? And like, how definite? Like, I want to know in detail how delicate it is. It's very delicate. And, I mean, what happens if you sneeze like midway through cutting but somebody's ear open? Fortunately, <laughs> I've been doing this for, for almost 20 years now. Yeah. And I'm a professor in the field. I train another doctor. Yeah. It's a microsurgery. You need a microscope. And where do you go? In you, the we can go, we go through the ear or we can cut behind the ear. Yeah. Mm. And uh, no tremor, no screaming, everybody must be patient. And that day I don't even take coffee because otherwise I'll be having a lot of tremors. Yeah, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. You know, we've, Bali and I have actually been invited to go and watch a lung transplant, I yes. think. So we're going to be in theatre. But I always am so fascinated. You know, when I think of, of exceptional surgeons, I think that you were born to be this gifted. You were born yes, to change yes. the world as you did. Yes, yes, it's an yes. absolute gift. But I want to know about your mindset and... Do you, what is, do you have a ritual when you're in surgery? Is there a particular way that you breathe? What is going on in your mind? You have headphones and listening to opera music. How do you, how do you maintain that absolute discipline to be so precise? Fortunately is that you always have to prepare the night before. You yeah. re-revise, you re-look, you work on the lab. Yeah. And then the following day you give yourself a good rest. That's how I do. And then I run the whole operation before I go to theatre. In the morning when I go to theatre, I'm a religious person, so I just said, please, yeah. uh, may I be helped all the way. And then I play music at the same time. And my, because when I play music, my mind is on that operation. Yeah. And I know that from this step to that step. So I have the whole operation laid out in my mind even before I start operating. Yeah. Now, I think the whole world's eyes on you now because yes. of this amazing achievement. Yes, what does yes. this mean for you personally? I think for me, it is not my success. I think it's a, it's a success of the whole uh, uh, country, let alone South Africa, let alone an African child, but let alone medicine. So yeah. for me, I said, let's all celebrate. And on, on top of that, let's be encouraged that each yeah. one of us has an ability to change the world. Yeah. So this is the beginning of more research. So I consider myself going for the other 10 to 20 years just researching on deafness. Yeah. That is what I'm happy to have an area where I can be called an expert. Yeah. So I need to really be an expert in this area. Yeah, and you are. We are so yes, fortunate yes. No, to thank have. Thank you so much. You, congratulations on your absolutely tremendous feat. Let's you. see what South Africa has to say in celebrating you today. <laughs> so we've asked you on our social media platforms if you've got any questions for the prof. And we've got Umaba Sonia Leti who asks, what inspired him to choose this specific speciality as a black man? And what kept him motivated whilst pursuing it? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I used to suffer from tonsils yeah. and I used to have a lot of uh, nose bleeding and uh, my tonsils were removed 10 years ago as a professor. So when I remove somebody's tonsils, then I know what I'm talking about. So that's what motivated me. But for deafness, I have to remain focused because once you look on something for a long time, invariably you are going to discover something which nobody has ever looked at it. Yeah. So that's what kept me on going. I mean, for 10 years, I mean, it's a long time. It is. Yeah. Absolutely. Next question. Mm. We've got Kiabeto Moko Teddy who asks, what inspired or motivated him to go into being a professor at such a young age? <laughs> I'm currently <laughs> studying, so my motive is to reach that professional level. Any tips or quotes for me on how to reach that level? 
I think the most important thing is that I never aspired to be a professor to start with. Mm. For me, I was just enjoying what I'm doing. So your work will make you a professor and you'll make you great. So you don't have to aspire to be a professor. Just aspire to be the best in what you have and live life as if it's your last day today and be the best in whatever you do. Yeah. Then your work will promote you because if you strive to get uh, titles and position, I mean titles are titles, so what? Mm. And I, even a lot of people say, just call me Mashudu, it doesn't matter. You know, oh. title is okay, but don't aspire <laughs> to be a professor. Yeah. Be yourself. And Thank that's what you. kept me going. That's very good advice. Yes. We've got time for one more question. Well, Jeannie, the last question we have to have to ask, now that you are a professor, you've got this title, how does it feel? <laughs> oh, wow, it feels good. It's great, you know. <laughs> it's a big achievement, and uh, I'm grateful to the men above. Amazing. But I need to walk the talk. Yeah. I always say a professor or whoever you are, if you're a professor, you must prophesy. So what I've done, it attests to me being called a professor. Yeah. So I encourage other professors there that please come with groundbreaking work. Yeah. May yes. you continue to do extraordinary things. Thank, Thank you. you so Thank much you for being so here much. today. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm sure South Africa says challenge accepted. Yoga guru Angelique Frederick shares some benefits of using yoga for your health after the break. Plus, we make a hearty chana masala style curry with Chef Aya.